morning. It is good to be with you in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Two people are excited to be with me in the house of the Lord this morning. So that's so exciting. It is good to see some familiar faces over here. Good morning, guys. It's so good to be with you this morning. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. And we're going to have a couple of announcements this morning. First, I want to say, if you're a first-time guest with, you, with us, we want to say welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And if you don't mind, there should be, if you were not given a little card, there should be a card maybe in the um, seat there. And if you can fill that out and either just drop it into the um, offering plate or give it to an usher on your way out, or Pastor and I should be back there. You can give it to us too. We'd just like to get to know you and maybe connect a little bit more with you. So um, let's see, a um, couple of other qu uh, questions, not questions, um, announcements. Um, we are going to be having our women's conference coming up. Um, you know, it's exciting, right? And so, um, but it's going to be October the 3rd, and it's going to be here at the church. It's going to be a virtual conference because of COVID and all of those things. Um, but the cost is $30, and so you have until September the 15th to pay that money. She's running back out. What's going on? I don't know. Do you want my mic? I gotta slow my speech down so I don't spit in her mic. Um, but anyways, so coming up on October the third, it'll be from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Lunch will be served at, here at the church. Also, thank you, another team player. That is awesome. Um, so lunch will be served here at the church. I know there's gonna. It's um, Jane's gonna be sending out some uh, little boxes to the leaders here to uh, Stephanie, and then there's gonna be. Some things in there. We'll probably have some giveaways and all kinds of fun stuff. But the most important thing is, is that we get to be together as a community and women um, of God and believers. And I know Pam Barber is going to bring some ladies from her church to come down. And so uh, we have a, quite a few that are that are going to be here. So it's going to be exciting. You don't want to miss out on that. If you've not signed up, you can. Uh, you can just see me after after service if you're interested. Again, money's not due until the 15th. They also have two shirts available if you're interested in a t-shirt. They cost anywhere between $16 to $18 depending on the size. And let's see. Our missionary Becky Hoshaw was able to take a few steps on her own and to rehab, so that's good news and things are going there. We need to um, pray for Pastor Terry. He was uh, in a bicycle accident. Uh, him and his family, they decided to take their adult children up to Colorado to have a little adult getaway and they were on mountain biking and he fell off and broke his collarbone and had surgery two days ago so they put some plates and screws in there they said the doctor said that they think he'll have full recovery full range of motion but it's just going to be the go through of all the pain with that too so if you can remember pastor terry and and karen and your prayers as well i'm sure that uh, they would appreciate that i think that's all of our announcements this morning um i feel like there was one more Children's Church has started uh, September the 9th. This Wednesday, we're going to be starting back our Bible study together. That is so exciting. Yes. I hope that you guys are continuing your Bible study reading on your own, but there's nothing like being with the body of believers and learning about God's Word. Amen? So let's get our tithes and offerings this morning, and let's stand, and we're going to pray over them. This is our first act of worship this morning, and uh, we know that God is good, and God is on the throne, and He blesses those and honor those and that that will be obedient to him also this is where he says to test me okay so let's hold our tithes and offerings and let's pray father god we are so grateful god that you've given us this day that god we can come together with fellow believers that god we can come together in a community and god in a building god that we can just worship you freely and god we thank you lord for all that you're doing in the body in your body god we thank you for touching their lives of those. We thank you for touching Becky Hoshaw. We thank you for touching Pastor Terry this morning. God, all of those that have unspoken needs, we ask that you just minister to them this morning. That as the words are sung this morning, as the worship is played, as Pastor brings the word this morning, that your spirit will go forth and minister to those that need a healing in their body, that need a financial touch, that just need a breakthrough of some sort. Now, God bless the gift and the giver this morning. And Lord, let your, let your glory be shined and praise this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Let's worship together. How about that? This is a time. Let's do it. <laughs> Now the darkness 
his face into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope we are our creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God we will not
worthy. He is worthy. He's worthy. He is worthy of our praise. Child of God, it's time to just give him one more clap offering right now. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in his presence this morning. Hallelujah. We got just a uh, little bit of stuff to take care of this morning before we get to preaching the word. We're going to see how this works. Since um, this whole COVID thing hit us, uh, I have been amazed and overwhelmed by the, the commitment to people in this church, the, um, the leadership, this, the, the undying dedication. Um, the worship team, um, since we started this thing, when they closed the, everything down and we couldn't have live services... They would get here on Saturday, we would film the service, and they would, they would give everything they got to an empty room, thinking of you every time they did it. And uh, it, was, it was challenging, but they pulled through. And without this worship team up here, without this, the, all of our technicians and everything like that, we wouldn't be where we're at today. So today, what I want to do is, is honor those that have been on this team uh, one of our board members, Jason, he, he mentioned, hey, you know what, why don't we do something for them? And so I thought, you know, another great idea. So, hun, come on up here. I'm going to, if you're on the worship team, I'm going to read your name off. And I want you to haul your tail back down here. Even if you're up there in the balcony, Bill, um, you're going to have to come down here to the front and receive this, what I've got for you. Because you're not going to get it up there because I can't throw it. So, Bill, come on down. You're number one. Here, I'll just let you hold those and I'll read them out. And Cinda, while he's doing that, you can come on down too. You've been part of this worship team. So if you want to just march down here, or he can bring it to you. Your husband is a good servant. That'll, that'll work. Okay. So Bill and Cinda Unru, let's give them a hand right there. <laughs> Amen. And there's a, few, there's a few names on here that I don't see in here this morning, but I'll mention them and then we'll give them their cards a little bit later. But uh, uh, Kelsey Hitchcock, she's been working in the sound booth. Is she here today? I don't know that I've seen her. Kelsey Hitchcock, we'll give her a hand anyways. Um, another one, Miranda Wilson. I don't see Miranda today. Did you let her sleep in? No, just kidding. Miranda Wilson, give her a hand. Um, and Sherilyn Hoffman, is she? I don't see Sherilyn. Is she, she no, no, Okay, so Sherilyn's another one. Give her another hand. Hey, we're going to get to somebody here. Um, Gary Michaels, come on down. You're the next contestant. Yes, and the amazing thing is we see the finished product, and after, you know, Crystal and Tyler get done working with these people, they're exhausted every Thursday night, and, and it's amazing. Um, another person that's been on the worship team, and she's been a, a, a part of this team, is Lana Reinhardt. Lana, come on down. Thank you. Is uh, Susie and Jason Michaels here? I haven't seen, oh, there they are. I didn't see them come in. Come on down. Both of those are worship, working the, the sound booth and on the, on the worship team. Um, Tara Kirshner, you're, oh, easy, right here in the front row. Now, this one will be quick because these are all in the same row. Leona Bill, Fred Bill, Fiona Bill, where's Phoebe? Phoebe's in the back. Oh, Phoebe, you got to run down here so people can see your smiling face. Meet her halfway. Hallelujah, it, all those people. See, they get in the back because they don't want to be up here all the time. So, uh, Is Tina Miller here? Tina Miller, did I see her anywhere? Tina, not today. Okay, uh, give her a hand. What about John Sanchez? It's John, Johnny Boy. No, no Johnny Boy today. Give him a hand anyway. Uh, Susan Rogie, I seen her. Come on down, we'll meet you halfway. Amen. Listen, it takes a lot of people to put this on because of the way that they work so hard for it. Um, Mario and Gabby. Mario, come on down. Come on down, Mario. See, Gabby wants your uh, gift too, so you better hurry up and get down here and get it, or she may get it. Amen. 
Katie Snyder, come on down. You're the next contestant. You know, if Angie would work on her ninja skills, she could probably, you know, it stick them. Tyler Sartain, come on down. Oh, there you go. Good job. Uh, Ed and Trevor, come on down. And Crystal as well, but she's not here. Go ahead and give, give him Crystal too. Trevor will be running down them stairs. Just don't let him trip. Crystal is still out. She's still working with her mom. She asked if she could still take a few more weeks. Uh, we need to pray for her mom. Uh, she's getting better, but she just felt like she needed it to, to be at home and, and taking care of her mom. And we absolutely understand that. So uh, I told her the other day when I talked to her, I said, you've trained your worship team very, very well. And uh, you've done great in the leadership aspect of that. So now with that, we have one, one more thing. Do you got a mic? Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Miss Angie and let her take care of this next part. Okay, I think we're good. So I was thinking, how does one person say a thank you to someone who has served so faithfully for multiple, multiple years? And I come to the conclusion that it's impossible. And so I want to read a few things that would describe, I believe describes this individual. And this is touched this much of the iceberg. I want to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. This person, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away, way, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known, and these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I've got another scripture verse that describes this person. Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It describes this individual. Last scripture verse that I'm going to read to you that I believe um, describes this individual and then we're going to surprise them. And it is found, well, I'm not going to tell you where it's found. I'm just going to read it. A wife of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it out of her earnings. She plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. With her, her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindles with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes the seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants and sash with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you, Marge, surpass them all. Could you join us up here?
I want you to know this woman right here is an amazing woman. She has served about 55 years, 55 years of faithful service to the kingdom of God. 35 years of those were served in the nursery raising your children. This woman right here, I think they might have broke the mold. But I would suggest you come rub elbows with her so maybe we can pass all of that down. But Marge, we want to say we thank you. We see Jesus in you. We see Jesus through you. And we have a group of littles that want to come say hi. Amen. Wow, right, amen. amen. We yeah. cannot we cannot begin we cannot begin to, to give you the many thanks. How many of you in here had your children in and Marge was helping with your children? Yes. Amen. She is an amazing woman. I have one more thing to read to you, Marge. Through the years we wonder how many children you transported to church? How many toddlers you helped down the little tyke slide? You know, I think she can do the splits. I don't know if she can anymore, but how many toddlers you helped? Okay, how many kiddos you took to the bathroom? How many babies you comforted when mommy left the nursery? How many diapers you changed? How many bulletin boards you created for the nursery? How many sheets and blankets you washed and toys you sterilized? How many songs you taught the babies? How many cradle roll Sundays you stressed over talking to the congregation? And how many lives were changed for Jesus because you stepped up, did what you felt like God wanted you to do, and you had a heart for God. And through that, we see and we get to reap the benefits of that. So, Marge, from our heart to you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your serving and for loving Jesus and loving kiddos. Now, we have a few more things for you, so don't go away. Amen. Amen. I got it. Hey, you get a hug. <laughs> Quick, take pictures. That's number one. Okay. These, we asked, we, we, we did a little, you know, secret thing, and we said, you know, we want to shower Marge with blessings, and so uh, people in the congregation that have, have been touched by your ministry have, have sent cards to you. We also, someone sent a, hey, Roger, can you come up here and help me, brother? Uh, I got a, I got a, 35 roses for you, one for every year you've served in the nursery. So I'm going to have Roger grab a hold of them. And here's another little gift somebody brought. You want, me, you want Roger to handle that? Or? Okay. Okay. You, you know, you can open it when you get home and all that kind of thing. And I think if anybody didn't get a chance to give your cards to me before the service, just grab, give them to, to Marge as she, she goes out. Let's give her one more hand. Oh. And this is from us. Yeah. Speech. Oh. Amen. Thank you, Marge. Thank you so much. (laughs) 
at least, uh, at least Pastor Angie did a little bit nicer than Jonathan did. Jonathan wanted to say, all of those that have had their rear ends wiped by Marge, please stand. And she, he didn't, we didn't do that because, you know, she'd have probably got, she'd probably beat Jonathan at that point. But that's what ministry is about. I mean, that's longevity. Uh, we can all learn something from that. I mean, it, it, she, she's never asked for anything from us. Never once. Unless it's something for the nursery. But um, she's just done it out of faithful heart and a love for you and a love for your children. Boy, that's, that's, that's a Proverbs 31 woman right there. So, amen. Now, I'm going to try to preach after all that. Hallelujah. Our God is, is amazing. Amen. He is so good. So, this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about victory or defeat. I believe that when we come to church, I believe that if you're watching this online, we need to make every moment count. I don't know that we have that many moments left on this planet before Jesus comes back, and we need to make sure that the time that we have, we make it count. And so last week, I, I spoke to you about being discouraged, and I've, I've had a lot of, of comments and things about that, and, and um, I've been so wrapped around the axle lately, and, and for those of you that don't know that, that's Missouri for really wound up. And, um, and it's all because of the, the madness going on in our countries, things that just don't make sense. Hello? I mean, you want to stop police violence by violent, being violent. Hmm. You want equal rights and social justice by destroying people's property and livelihoods. Hmm. In what stratosphere does that make sense to anybody? And the Lord brought this thought to me. Be careful because you will lose the battle in your mind if you keep getting sucked into the madness that's going around. So just as we, we talked about discouragement and we know it all starts with the mind, I want to help you how you and show you how you can live in, defic, in victory or how you can be defeated in your mind. Proverbs 23, 7 says this, as a man thinks, so is he. And one translation says, so he becomes. So as you allow thoughts into your mind and begin to permeate in your mind, you begin to change your lifestyle to those thoughts. If you've got your Bible, go to Ezekiel. This will be our, part of our text this morning. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 7. It says, Then he brought me to the entrance to the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, Son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and I saw a doorway. And he said unto me, go in and see the wicked and detestable things that are going on in there. So I went in and I looked and I saw all portrayed over all the walls, all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals and idols of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of Israel. And Jezanahai, uh, son of Jephan, was standing among them. Each had a censer in their hand. A fragrant cloud of incense was rising. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen, watch this, what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. That's in the NIV. The King James says, Every man in the chambers of their imagery or in the cha chambers of their mind. Isaiah 59, verse 5, it says, They hatched deadly snakes and weaved spider webs. And whoever eats of the eggs will die. Whoever cracks them open will hatch a viper. Verse 4 says, No one cares about being fair and honest. These people's lawsuits are based on lies. They conceive evil deeds and then give birth to sin. Now, if anybody has ever been hunting, you've ever been out walking in the field, one of the creepiest things that ever happens is when you're walking and all of a sudden, boom, you walk right into one of the spider webs. And then you're doing like this. I mean, I'm telling you what, we're just, why? Why would, you do, why would those little bitty spider webs mess with you so bad? Because we all know there was a creature that made those things. One of those little spiders that we don't like, right? And we're trying to, and, and, and when, it, when it talked about weaving the spider web, and, and have you ever noticed that once those things get on you, they just don't come off very easy? So notice the wording here. 
It says, when these evil deeds are conceived, it gives birth to sin. You, look, you don't just wake up one day and start sinning. There is a progress or a progression or a process that takes place. And I am amazed to see God do great things for people. And they get, they get right. Look, everything's going good. God pulls their bacon out of the fire. Then all of a sudden, things going really well, and they jump right back into sin. The enemy has to first get his snake eggs, his viper eggs in your head. And once his eggs are in your head and they are broken up, it says it breaks out into a viper. Now, a viper represents wrong thinking and evil thoughts that Satan wants to implant into your mind. And look, I have dealt and felt the presence of of demons, but the greatest battle I've ever faced is the battle between my ears. Anybody with me today? And when Satan begins that battle between your mind, when he's battling for it, and he can get his vipers into your head, and if you don't get them dug out of there by renewing of your mind and a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit, then it's just a matter of time before those vipers begin to fill your mind with poison and your spirit, and you lose the touch of God on your life. Now, do you think that the people who have done the mass shootings over the years just woke up one day and said, hey, I'm just going to go kill students? They didn't just wake up one day and and say, this would be a great day to commit murder. No, the enemy somewhere along the line, maybe months or even years before, got thoughts of rejection, thoughts of violence, thoughts of murder and evil implanted into their hearts and their minds, incubating until finally it hatched open and a serpent came out. Evil thoughts are like vipers in your head. They get in there until the time is right. That's why you have to watch your thought life. That's why you have to guard what you allow to come in your your eye gates and your ear gates because the real battle will always take place in our mind. Our thoughts are so powerful. So let's look at King David for a moment and his adultery with Bathsheba. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 4. Now people talk like David just woke up one day and he decided to sin. Okay? David was 50 years old when he committed the sin, the sin of adultery. That should be a lesson to those of us who think just because we've reached a certain age and maybe we have a certain walk with God that we don't have anything to worry about. If you study it out, most of the men who committed sin of adultery was around 50 years old. So men and women, don't let your guard down. Divorce, listen, divorce among Christians is actually higher than the world today. Studies show that 7 out of 10 people who live together before marriage get divorced. Why do you think, well, I'm going to not jump on that box yet. There were three things that the king of Israel should not do. These are three things that, that, that God said, kings do not do this if you're a king of Israel. Number one, kings do not multiply horses under themselves. When David won a great battle, he would slay all the horses. Number two, kings were not to multiply gold and silver to themselves. David gave $40 billion dollars out of 50 billion to Solomon to build the temple of God. So David didn't have a problem with accumulating wealth or accumulating horses. The third thing, watch this, kings are not to multiply wives unto themselves. 20 years, watch the progression, 20 years before he committed adultery with Bathsheba, If you go to 2 Samuel 5.13, and it says this, And David took unto himself more concubines and wives. He must have fancied himself as a ladies' man. Now listen, I marvel at the patience of hell. 20 years before he committed, the, 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 the Bible has said that David was a man after God's own heart. 20 years before, he began to do things that he should not have done. And watch what happens. See, you better be careful what you wink at. You better be careful what you smile at because the enemy studies us and he sees. And when, we will be, when, we, when he's going to be able to plant a viper in our head, and it may not happen immediately. It may take a month, a year, even 20 years. The enemy is patient and he waits until it's, he gets his thoughts to, to get into the incubator of your mind. And they're just sitting there waiting. David had the thoughts that he can have any woman he wanted because 20 years ago, the enemy planted into his mind, hello, he's 50 years old now, 
20 years ago, he just all of a sudden, he didn't just jump and say, I'm going to go commit adultery. But 20 years ago, the thoughts were there and the progression begins to happen. And so David is 50 years old. He's on the balcony of his castle. And he walks over to the edge of his castle and he looks down and he sees the UFO. We all know what that is, right? The unclad female object. That's what the UFO is in the Bible. Just go read it. It's there. Now, look, it didn't say that he just looked at her. If David would have said, oh, Lord, I just seen a naked woman. I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind and I'm getting into the palace. If he would have done that, things would have been better. But the scripture indicates that he looked at her and kept on looking. Now, when your look voice is stronger than your don't look voice, you're in trouble. Now, watch this. 2 Samuel chapter 11. The Bible said that when the kings were supposed to be at war. See, David was supposed to be at war. It was a time. Back in those days, they had certain times of the, of the year because of the, the, the seasons. That was better to go to war than others. So he was supposed to be at war at this time that he was looking at Bathsheba. I want somebody to understand something. When you're doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing, you're ripe for the devil to put thoughts in your mind. You're ripe for the devil for those vipers to jump out. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. And this king was supposed to be at war. And what was he doing? He was sitting back on the balcony taking it easy. The enemy has got to get his thoughts into your mind. He has to plant his vipers into your head. So don't underestimate the power of thoughts because thoughts brought the greatest king of Israel down. We live in a sensual world and more and more Christians are going to have to guard what comes on their, their TV or their, their iPhones or whatever it is. They're going to have to guard what their children's doing on the internet because these vipers, the enemy wants to get them incubating in your mind. We've got to have boundaries. We've got to set standards. Listen, there has got to be in the Christian realm certain things that we just don't do anymore. We have gotten so full of this grace message. Well, God's grace, God's grace, God's grace. It'll, it'll take care of me. I can sin all I want to. No, 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 no. That's not what grace is for. Grace is to give you more faith and more power to walk in God's love, not just to wash over your sins every time you just decide you're going to do it. Well, David, he could have said, other kings are taking on more wives. Why can't I? David, all I know is that you're supposed to be different than everybody else because you're called to a higher standard than everybody else. You're not like every, listen, Christians in here today, you're different than everybody else and you're called to a higher standard than everybody else. No amens there. Your Bible says you're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're a child of God. Don't compromise. This isn't a popular message, but a reason why so many Christians are defeated is because they don't understand that if you keep feeding garbage into your mind and your spirit and you keep feeding off of negative stuff into your life like gossip and backbiting, there is a viper ready to hatch. It's caused, caused them to fall away from God. Yet people get upset when the preacher preaches holiness and living right. Well, pastor, you don't judge me. Can I just tell you something that I really don't need to judge you? God's going to take care of all that himself. You don't know what I mean. You don't know my heart, pastor. I don't need to know your heart. God does. That's why you're in the mess you are. Hello? David never considered how far an evil thought would take him. He lost control of his thought life. So some say, oh, I would never do that. But when you toy around with sin and you begin to wonder what it would be like, anybody ever had those thoughts? Don't raise your hand. I can't wait to go out of town on that business trip. I won't be around my wife or my family. Maybe I can smoke a little of that stuff over in Colorado. I wonder what it would be like to get drunk. I wonder what it would be like to have a one-night stand. You begin to, to, in, to entertain those thoughts. You may not be able to keep a bird flying over your head, but you can keep him from making a nest in your hair. Amen? You may not be able to keep those thoughts from coming in, but you can keep them from getting in there and, and, and uh, putting vipers in your head. The devil is going to get in. If he first has to plant something in you, he will he'll use your eye gate or your ear gate 
to get those thoughts into your head. Now, Ezekiel said this. Now, this is amazing when you begin to trace this back. The Bible, from beginning to end, there's a thread. Watch this. Ezekiel 8 and 11, it says, 70 men of Israel, they said to themselves, God does not see, don't lie to yourself, he sees everything, people. God does not see what we are doing in the dark, in the secret chambers of our mind, or our imagery, of our imagination. These 70 men were along the same line, if you follow it, of the 70 elders that Moses put in place. You go, go back to the book where Moses is, is overworked and he's trying to figure this out. And his father-in-law says, hey, you need to get some men in here to help you. And they, get, they got 70 elders to help him. They had a plan and they had a purpose in Exodus 18. Now, just a few generations later, you have these 70 elders that was a part of the plan and purpose of God for building God's kingdom. And they've got vipers hatching in their minds. God showed Ezekiel those 70 elders through the peephole into the secret chambers of their imagery. Now, this is the first reference to pornography in the Bible. He saw all kinds of vile things and abominations that were written on the wall, filthy pictures that were written on the wall of their minds. The enemy got in vipers in their head. They said, God doesn't see us. That is the biggest lie of hell you're ever going to lie to yourself with. God sees it. God doesn't, he doesn't, he, God doesn't see, yes, he sees it. But God said, tell them I put a peephole into their head and I can see everything that's going on in the side of their imagery, the chambers of their mind. And the sad thing is this, watch this, this is amazing. You trace those 70 men back to the 70 men that helped Moses, okay? So we're here, we go back, we see that that's where it started at, 70 men over there. And they were used by God, but the enemy through the generations was able to plant vipers into their head. And then you trace those 70 men all the way to the New Testament, okay? So watch me. We got 70 of these guys Ezekiel's talking about, 70 people in Moses talked about. And then we go all the way to the New Testament. And there are 70 men called the Sanhedrin. Think about this for a second. The Sanhedrin, 70 men, members of the Sanhedrin court. And these are the ones who crucified Jesus. Wow. All because of a thought that was not checked, that wasn't kicked out. They go from the plan and purpose of God. Listen, everybody, every one of us, we start off, we get saved, we're excited, we're going to do something great for God. We're here, we're at the 70, we've got a plan and a purpose. All of a sudden, we get farther and farther away from that encounter that we had for God, and we don't keep renewing that encounter. We don't keep renewing that, 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 that power and that passion for the Lord. We get over here, and all of a sudden, these thoughts begin to come into our minds, and then we get all the way over to here to where we've turned our back completely upon Jesus, and then we're the ones nailing him on the cross. That's exactly what happened right here in this story. So let me give you just a few examples before we get out of here of thoughts or vipers that are getting in people's minds today. The, the first one I want to talk to you about is pornography. Watch this. This blew my mind as I pulled the research up on this. It said 40 million people have subscribed to Internet pornography in the U.S. in one year. 40 million. 40 million people pay their subscriptions faithfully to their pornography provider. 6.9 billion that's what the B, dollars, is spent annually on pornography. Every second, there are 28,258 users watching pornography. Every second of every day. So when you look at pornography, it's like getting a blood transfusion from hell. The enemy is planting thoughts in your head. And it's a matter of time before those serpents come out and poison your marriage and your children and your future and your anointing and God's purpose for your life. But your Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, think on these things. What? Whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is holy, whatsoever is good, whatsoever is righteous. you got to start thinking on those things. The devil has already planted some vipers into some man's head about packing up and leaving his wife. And it all started with the viper of pornography. There's a woman, the, dev the devil is planting a, uh, those vipers in her head and about that low down, no good for nothing husband and I ought to just leave him and, it, it, and if he can't make it, he ain't gonna make it with nobody. Vipers. Here's a statistic, watch this. Only one in 1,000 couples that pray together daily ever get divorced. I just solved a lot of your marriage problems right there. Thank you, pay more in the offering as you leave. 
You want your marriage to be successful? Pray together. That tells me that we as Christians need to start making sure we're fasting and praying instead of feasting and playing. Teenagers have thoughts planted into their minds that says, what's the use of staying a virgin? What's the use of living a holy life? I feel like giving up. Thoughts of suicide. Nobody cares about me. Nobody's going to miss me when I'm gone. Thoughts of abortion. The thought of embarrassment. The thought of what will people think. The enemy's trying to get you to make wrong decisions. The Bible is using thoughts like nobody appreciates you here. Why don't you just leave this church? God created places before he created people, so you better not leave your assigned place. You better be careful that you don't walk out of your anointing place because, listen, at times it takes more faith to stay than it does to leave. That's true. Here's a viper that has taken this generation by storm. This next one is called evolution. I love this story. You know the theory that you were, you came from a monkey? Now, I met a few people that might give a little bit of credit to. But if you think that evolution has, if you don't think evolution hasn't penetrated every core of society, then why can we abort since 1973 52 million babies? If evolution, if, 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 if all we did was come from some blob... Why can kids walk into school and shoot each other like it's some kind of game? Because we put in their minds that all we are is glorified dirt, and when we die, we go back to dirt. At some point in your life, you might have a professor or some other person who believes in evolution come up to you and say, well, this is how the world began. I'm going to help you out. Once upon a time, there was this water, and in the water there was this stuff called protoplasmum, and all these microbes and cells, and well, these cells got to wiggling around together and through evolution and climation, all of a sudden, these cells grew a tail, which then turned into a tadpole. And after a while, that tadpole got wiggling around, and, and through evolution and climation, that tadpole grew scales and fins. Then there was this big storm, and it blew this fish up onto the beach. Well, that fish started wiggling around so much he lost all of his scales and his fins. He started growing four little nubs and crawling on the ground eating grass. Then a big famine came across the land. That little creature had to stand up on his hind legs to eat from the tree. And through evolution, those four knobs turned into legs and arms and, and he could climb around in the trees. And then the ice age came. And this little animal grew hair and a long tail so he could hang from the tree and eat. Well, here we are. Listen, it takes more faith to believe that than it does to believe in the beginning God created man and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. You are more than dirt. You didn't come from any animal. You were made in the image and the likeness of God Almighty. You are worth something to God. Are you hearing me this morning? Because he loves you so much, he died for you. Now, my great, 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 great grandpa might have hung from a tree from the neck, but never by his tail. Now, a boy heard a teacher, and if you're a teacher in here, please forgive me, but I'm going to go ahead and lay this one out. A boy heard a teacher speak on evolution, and after the teacher was finished, the boy asked his teacher if he, could, if he was in a good mood, because this teacher, he thought, boy, he just nailed it. He's convinced all these little minds of mush that evolution was real. And the boy asked the teacher, hey, could he read him a poem that he just wrote? And the teacher said, sure, go ahead, son. And the boy said, in the beginning, it was just a micro beginning to begin. Then it was a tadpole, tadpole with his tail tucked in. Then it was a monkey hanging from a tree. Now it's a professor with a PhD. <laughs> Look, I'm so glad we serve a God of creation. And we've got to get the snake egg of, of evolution out of our head. If God said it, that settled it. Genesis 1.6 gives us the who of creation, but not the how. So forget about the how and take a hold of the who and watch your life change forever. There's another viper that we got to get rid of, and that's the viper of our past. Has anybody ever had their past come up and bite them in the backside? Hebrews 8, 12. He will blot out, listen, this is for somebody here today. He will blot out your transgressions and remember your sins no more. It annoys God when we try to forget when he tries to forget your sin and you keep bringing it up. 
God wants you to get into your head and dig out some of those thoughts of the past, those things that keep holding you back, the thoughts that will keep telling you that you're no good and you won't mount to nothing if you don't get them out. They're, they're a power to enslave you. You'll never get to your future if you don't let go of your past. Now this next one I'm going to tread lightly on. There's a viper of homosexuals. Did you realize that a good majority of the church is homosexual? Now I'm not saying homosexual. I'm saying homosexual. Sections. We all just like our own kind. Just give me my four no more. This section and this section. I don't want to go over to that section because I don't know if I like them people on that side of the church. There's a viper of homosexuals. We just, all of a sudden, we just close in. Watch this. Listen to this. In the church, there have been times that I've seen people come into the church and they weren't accepted. Maybe they just didn't look right. Maybe they didn't talk right. Maybe they didn't act right. Right. And I'm telling you what, in this church, I hope that that never, ever, 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 ever happens. Because we need to be the love of Jesus no matter who walks through the doors. No matter whether they got tattoos or, or, or nose rings or even looks like him. I mean, we just... Listen, I've said it a million times and I'll say it a million one. I, I can't wait for the day that we have Ozzy and Ozzy and Harriet right here and Ozzy Osbourne down here. That's what it's about. That's what being the church is all about. It's not about being our four no more. Because I'm telling you what... When the greatest crown of glory that you and I will have is when we get to heaven and we say, you see these people down here? These are the ones that came to the Lord because I witnessed to them. Because I just, I just opened up my heart to them. Not, you're not going to get any pat on the back from God if all of a sudden we go, no, I don't want them. They don't smell right. They don't look right. They don't have the right whatever. The viper of homosexuals. We've got to get rid of that viper because it's destroying the church. Whatever happened to United We Stand Divided we fall. Well, what happens in our country today? Let me just say loud and proud, I love our nation. I love our people. But there's a viper of division that is trying to destroy what our forefathers have built. It's a viper, and in order for the church to experience the power of God, we've got to dig out that viper and show the love of Christ to all people on this planet. There's a viper that's trying to destroy our lives. We've got to dig them out. How? By the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Jesus. Power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Now, Ezekiel 8, 12 says this, and I'm almost done. The Lord sees us not. This is the biggest lie that you can tell yourself. God sees what you're doing on the telephone committee. Uh-oh. God has drilled a hole and sees exactly what you're doing. Do you think that the great preachers of all time fell overnight? No. It was because they allowed a thought to be put into their head and then they hatched sin in their lives. Don't think you can come into the house of God and worship him and then go out and do every vile thing that you can imagine. You grieve the Holy Spirit when you do that. It's just so hard, Pastor. Don't give me that. Why don't you let me just kind of listen to that musical pornography you're listening to? Hello. What type of people are you hanging out with? What are you allowing to come into your house? Your Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Matthew 18, God said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Worship team, come on up. The Bible said the place of Calvary is called the what? Skull. The place that, the place that Jesus hung on the cross and died was called the skull, Calvary. That is the place that we win and lose our battles right from the beginning. You've got to get rid of the thoughts by changing what you do, cleaning out your mind. Philippians 4, 8, think on these things. Whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is noble, whatsoever is good report, think on these things. Would you stand with me now? You know what I'm saying? It's a battle. I know it's a battle. What do you think we pastors just walk around in a bubble? Like when somebody ticks us off, we don't get upset about it? And we don't have that negative thought like, boy, God, just strike them now. We all have thoughts. The difference 
is when a thought comes in your mind, you've got, Paul said, I take captive every thought that comes into this mind that exalts itself before the knowledge of Christ. And I get rid of it. You want to win the battlefield of the mind? You want to win this, this thing and you want to walk in victory every day of your life? And you got even those little self-deprecating thoughts, I'm no good, blank my life. You got to quit that stuff. You got to stop it. You are made in the image of God. God doesn't make junk. He makes masterpieces. Every one of us are a unique masterpiece. Some of us are a little different than the others. That's okay. As we sing this song, if you're in here today and you're going to say, Pastor, man, I've, I've been battling and battling and battling. Last week you talked about discouragement, and this week you're talking about me and my thought life. If you're in here and you're battling it, I want you to get to these altars right now as this worship team begins to sing. Say, God, I'm surrendering to you my thought life because I don't want to be the one that turns and, and, and goes from planning and purpose to crucifying you. Go ahead, Tyler. Hallelujah. Come on. Thank you, Jesus.
words. It's telling us that we're less than. It's trying to destroy us from the inside out. And Lord, we walk in the power and the light that you've given us. Lord, we give you praise and glory and honor for these things. In your mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Whatever you do, don't let the, the vipers get into your head. Because once they get in there, they don't want to come out until they've struck. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock here at the church, our normal Bible studies are going to be up and running. Can't wait to get that going again. So we'll see you guys later. God bless every one of you.